Hello my soccer universe, uh, what a Serie A weekend we had and it seems that in almost every game, it was not every, every game, but almost every game there was major refereeing controversy and especially in VAR. I mean, if you uh, may, it started already in Genoa where Milan probably was a little bit aggrieved with Laos red, red card. Um, it went on then to Bologna, where Fiorentina was not happy with Bologna's winning goal. Lecce also was not happy with the referee, with the president coming out to speak instead of the coach, because he feels that uh, there's a bias against the southern teams. But it all culminated in the madness in Turin, which we will put ample on emphasis on, because it was just everything that can go wrong went wrong there. And I'm afraid that the career of a young Italian referee is already hugely damaged despite him doing from what he could do all the right things. But you know, you never take on the beast that is Juve and deny them a win that they think they deserved. However, before we get into it, a word on Udine. They again, last uh, week I had to wear, of course, Milan because they won the Derby. Uh, and Udine actually was the uh, statistically the biggest winner. They are again. Udine is amazingly doing well this season. Their only loss was to a Milan team in, in the first game of the season against the reigning champions where they gave them quite some trouble. And while Milan historically always had trouble against Ud, Ud, Udine, it was not quite clear uh, how, how good Udine are. Well, it turns out I think Udine could be... Could be... A little bit like where Sassuolo and Fiorentina are feeding in or Verona make, making up this gap just below the absolute top teams that may make a push for a conference league spot. So I uh, definitely need to give credit to them. They're doing uh, amazing work in Friuli. And so um, gotta mention them and wearing their, jer uh, their jersey. And now here's for you Italian speakers out there. Um, one sidebar. I used to call them Udinese, I'm not, not calling them Udine, because I get upset when uh, English speakers call uh, Austrian teams uh, like Wolfsberger instead of Wolfsberger Athletic Club or just WAC, or same thing with Graz yeah, instead of just uh, Graz IK or, or something like that. So meaning it's kind of the, um, uh, it's not a word, Graz or Wolfsberger, uh, like a noun. For Udinese, I also think Udinese means from Udine. Is it proper to say Udinese? Do Italians say Udinese or do they say Udine? Or do they say the full name Udinese Calcio, which means basically the football club from, uh, from Udine. So that would be an interesting part uh, that I uh, would like to know. For now, I decide to just call them Udine because that's where they're from. So yeah, that said, uh, the VAR controversy, it's just... <laughs> and I've been saying in a short of it, and everything works well in Italy. Yeah, so far, I think actually overall it works well. But uh, the, the fact that the referee did not get the full picture in the Juve goal, because, you know, when you see it, uh, I mean, I saw it, I didn't see it live, but I saw it uh, because I, th I think it was more watching the Monaco game and the uh, uh, Villarreal Betis game. But then I saw that all hell broke loose. Uh, they had to have the spoilers on the zone below. They have little thoughts where something happens and you see in the uh, stoppage time, but basically, bong, dong, 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 dong. Uh, there's a penalty, then there is a talking point, then there are three red cards. Um, and so, uh, so okay. I better watch this and we'll get to the game uh, at the end. But I just, I just will say the supposedly winning goal for Juve. Um, at first you think, ah, this should be a good goal. Of course, everyone's celebrating. Then you see the replay. Yeah, Bonucci is offside, uh, but he makes a movement towards the ball. But uh, I don't think he catches the ball. So for me, anyway, it was a little bit... Yeah, do we really need to give it? I don't think he's interfering with, with the goalkeeper to begin with. So I uh, I didn't get that. Um, and then you hear that the VAR room did not have the full picture. That Cantareva, who was basically uh, covering the corner flag, did not make a step out and put Bonucci on side. So it was all a moot point. So uh, I can very much see why Juve is aggrieved. Now, 
we'll talk about this as well. Did Juve deserve that win? Absolutely not. They were horrendous against the Southern Italian team. On the other side, um, yeah, they were robbed. And yeah, you and the referees, I know it's a long story. Uh, books can and probably have been written about that. But in the overall grand scheme of things, I yeah, this is going to come back and haunt them, probably. Let's talk about some action on the field, because actually Saturday was very much a story of late winners for Napoli and Inter. Where Napoli, after this brilliant performance against Liverpool, uh, had a whole lot of trouble breaking down um, Spezia. Uh, and they had to wait until the very, very late 89th minute. It's a Spezia team that actually has won twice in Naples already. There are only two times they weren't went there. So it's the first time they're losing. It was then uh, through a Raspadori goal who had done nothing. Oseman, of course, injured. He will miss for four weeks. So uh, fortunately for Napoli, there's two, two, two of them are in the international break. But also uh, there's Champions League and then they have the big match against Milan next weekend. Um, it was also helped that Giovanni Simeone uh, basically tried to hit the ball, but hit uh, did not get it and that I, I, I think really um, irritated the defenders. So yeah, it was um, a hard fought win, but Napoli at least getting a win after not uh, uh, winning, I think the first home game against uh, Lecce, no, not the second home game against Lecce. Uh, Inter similar, they really, they had, a, uh, after losing the derby um, then, and, and then being totally outplayed by Bayern, they really needed to get something. But again, they played against a Torino team that I think will play a good role this season uh, that can take points off the big, uh, bigger teams. And despite all the, all the pressure, I always felt that Torino looked kind of comfortable until they didn't. When Barella uh, uh, gets the ball to Brozo, Brozovic, who just can put it into the net. Uh, yeah, it was necessary for Inter to get this win. Let's put that, 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 and let's take my personal feelings out, out, out of that, because there will be plenty now for Sampdori against Milan. Um, a game that actually should have been an easy win over, overall, um, but Milan, again, a little bit like what Lask did the last two, two, two weeks, made it a little bit harder for, for them than needed. I mean, the pressure from the game was pretty big, and uh, Leao assists Messias uh, to his first goal. There should have been a goal before that or, or, or already. Um, uh, also nice assist there of uh, the Ketelare uh, in there. So it, it seemed all be going well and then uh, missing a few chances. I mean, not playing really uh, great, but I thought that Milan had uh, full control over the game. Um, and they basically sealed the deal in the 20, 21st minute and went the Ketelare had it in. Except that before, before, uh, you know, there was an initial pass where Giroud was offside and the ball came out and got in where there was no off, off, offside. At first, I really didn't understand why this goal didn't stand. And I'm even not sure um, in some leagues, wouldn't that be a new phase of play? Because, you know, there was, it's not in the immediate, it was in the build up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I can probably get on board with it overall, but it seemed a little bit strange. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the Giroud um, tried to play the ball, of course, and that's why he was offside. That 2-0 would have settled the game. However, it didn't, and the Sampdoria didn't even had a few chances. Um, but most importantly, uh, Leao tried to defend himself against um, a defender. Uh, and with the elbow, uh, you know, try to freeze, uh, hits the face and gets a yellow card which I think is kind of all right, but it came back to haunt him because in the second half, he tries to do a bicycle kick. The ball is there and he bicycle kicks, uh, he misses the ball and gets in, in, into the face of, of the defender and is sent off with a second yellow card. Um, and here, I think by the law, and I actually can understand that this is uh, a yellow red, especially if you have been on the yellow, um, on the other side, it seems a little bit unnecessary for these two incidences to send uh, Leao off. Uh, we have this uh, Fingerspitzengefühl in German, which is kind of the fingertip feeling, you know, have a little bit feel for the game. Uh, it was not necess not totally necessary to send him off, uh, I would say, but I would have uh, given him a stern warning there. Of course, this sets Milan on a, um, a back and uh, at, uh, Sampdoria duly equalizes. Uh, through Djuricic, I think we had already 
scored before a, a goal that was disallowed or, or, or hit the cross, now he hit the crossbar. So um, the goal did not come exactly out of nowhere, but I knew that Milan need to dig deep and then they get a penalty uh, from the one chance. And uh, it was so weird because it seemed like Giroud had completely missed the head, head, head when you see the defender's arm getting over his shoulders, boxing the ball out. Giroud pulling the penalty uh, safely home uh, and then Milan just uh, had to write, uh, get it, uh, get the uh, game home. I have to say it was a little, it was not a great performance, but given the circumstances, I think they did the right things. Uh, we also had uh, Franks coming on, uh, then, you know, he brought on defenders to uh, shore up the back line and, you know, just get the three points and get out of here because there are big games come coming up uh, this weekend. Um, yeah. A win, but it's kind of a little bit of a period quick victory. Uh, the situation up top uh, remains rather tight thanks to Atalanta not winning. Uh, despite Cop Miners scoring two goals, but the first one being uh, disallowed for a handball uh, there as well. Um, Cop Miners being in really, really good form, and I remember him playing for AZ uh, when they played in Linz against Lask, so uh, it's very in 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 interesting to see him now playing Serie A to, to, to me. They get in the win at Cop Miners, assisting Demiral, um, and then with the one chance, I mean, all credit to uh, Cremonese, and here we have the same thing as we have for Udine, so Cremona. <laughs> Uh, all credit to them. Uh, they uh, they are a promoted team that actually does not just defend. They want to play with their opponents. So they're actually, the few times I saw them, uh, they're actually fun to watch. And they get the equalized through, through Valeri a little bit out of nowhere. And so Atalanta drop points and are not clear on top anymore. I did see um, the second half of Bologna against Fiorentina. Uh, where Quarta gave Fiorentina the lead, Musa Berra almost immediately equalizes and then a very contentious um, uh, winner through Marco Anatovic, who else? Uh, but Cassius, I think, in the, in the build, he wins the ball, but there was an elbow check in there, which I could see that this is called back. And uh, I mean, they had, the, uh, they had um, a good referee there. So I was a little, little bit surprised. I mean, uh, in, a, in a way, I wanted that Anatovic goal stand because I... He's also Austrian, and there's something about him that I like, despite his kind of uh, standoffish attitude at times. So yeah, in that sense, I wanted it to stand, but when I saw the replay, yeah, I think it probably should have been a, a call called off. But Fiorenti uh, but Bologna, who also have to mention, uh, sacked Mihailovic. So I mean, uh, that puts them in my neg neg negative book uh, in in a way. But after a second, they get a first win. So yeah, uh, gotta see if that will improve them at all. Uh, Udine leave it late, uh, were down at the half through due to a Fratesi goal, but um, uh, Sassuolo also uh, then got a red card in the 44th. Uh, they get equals through Beto in the 75th and then uh, in stoppage as Samaracic and again Beto bring it home for Udine. And as I said, they are uh, right up there with the uh, top uh, teams at this moment. We'll see that in the standings a little bit later. Uh, Lazio had quite some trouble with uh, Hellas for a while, but then in the end, it's Immobile, assisted by Milinkovic Savic, the dream duo uh, that uh, makes it 1-0 for Lazio. And then um, Luis Alberto in stoppage time after Zagani scores it. Uh, everyone was very happy for him. It, he just uh, doesn't seem happy. Because seemingly he doesn't get enough game time and is not happy with that with Sari and Sari again um, did also not behave all that well after the game. But as I said, it's Juve Salernitana. Salernitana had only scored one goal at Juventus so far. As far as I, uh, if I got this correct, they had a two 0 lead after half. Candreva scoring the first and then a Piontek penal penalty. Yes, you remember Piontek? Yep, uh, making it two 0 I think it's the first time that you were down two goals in also ages uh, at home. Maybe. No, it was not the first time in the new stadium. But, you know, it has been a long, 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 long time. Uh, the penalty was caused by a Bremer foul. And then he makes up for it. Uh, heads in a costage cross. Uh, you were looking suddenly better because in the first half, there was really nothing. Um, but Juve has a problem breaking down 
teams. And there should be enough talent there to do it. Allegri ball is not working. And to me, uh, I said in the last video, Allegri seems to be stuck in the 60s in his tactics at the moment. Uh, it does not look good and he also does not admit to it, which, which is a worse, a worse. And I really want to see how they will do against Benfica in the Champions League this week, because I think this will be a, fig, a, a do or die fixture for the season for Juve. Now, uh, Everyone is, of course, talking about the ending where um, first uh, penalty is given for Juve. I think it was, uh, uh, was it, uh, I think it was a Cotterano pass and Alexandro is fouled or something like that. Uh, Bonucci steps up. It's already stoppage time. Uh, the penalty is saved, but on the rebound, he hooks it in and it's a 2-2 and you think, yeah, Juve is uh, salvaging a draw. And then, even more so, a corner from Cuadrado that Milik had in and talked about it in the beginning. Um, that is then disallowed. Milik also takes his shirt off and is sent off for what is essentially now a disallowed goal. So uh, that's already stupid. Then Fazio did not want uh, want to get into the referee's ear um, uh, before he looked at the VAR pictures uh, of that goal. And at that point, everyone thought actually the game is already uh over so it was also a little a, a, a little bit weird a whole uh scramble between the players breaks out so Fazio and Quadrado are getting sent off as is Allegri who is um really uh aggrieved by VAR disallowing the goal because he probably saw or already from the tackle cameras that it was actually on site very I mean very um chaotic end to a game that was not a good, a good one that the storyline probably is now moving away from Juventus but maybe that's exactly what they wanted again it's a disgrace for a VAR in Italy uh, that this was not caught uh, this just cannot be and I think for me I really feel with the referee who actually got almost every call right in this game from, from what the information that, that was given he did everything the right way but I think that uh, I really hope it goes more into VAR than anyone else. So, yeah. That's all I want to say about that game. And then yesterday we had Roma winning 2-1 at Empoli. Beautiful Dybala goal. Uh, Dybala also hitting the uh, post, but so did Empoli uh, at one point. Uh, they get then the equalizer through Bandinelli. Uh, so it was a little bit hard, hard, hard work. But uh, Dybala then assists Abraham in the 71st. Roma also get a penalty that is missed uh, by the, the Pellegrini that hits the crossbar with it. So probably could, could have been a better win. Roma, I think, overlooked all rightish, but not convincing. I think um, on a different day, I think Empoli probably could have gotten a point out of that one. So now we have three with 14 points up top. Napoli, Atalanta, Milan, only separated by goal difference, which, you know, is not uh, in, any, in any case the final tiebreaker. As I said, Udine with 13 points in there. Only one loss as well. Uh, and then Roma and Inter also hang in there. Lazio, Juve, Torino. I think uh, we have nine teams that are up there. Fiorentina is not in there. Fiorentina is a little bit more in trouble. I don't think they will come in. Um, and if you look on the bottom, and we have now a point from Monza, but Monza and Lecce, two promoted teams, only 1-1. One, one. Uh, yeah, it doesn't get, get better. And Crem, uh, Cremonese have uh, two points. So I think all the promoted teams are in trouble. As at the moment seems Empoli. Hellas also not getting out of the stars, the starting blocks as is Sassuolo. Um, and it's all very reflected in the bars to the right where we see, I mean, uh, only Inter among the top teams and Juve, of course, uh, are not performing that well. But on the bottom, there are really, really many red bars. Um, expected standings, Milan still now, thanks to the data that are driving a smidgen uh, ahead of Inter. But again, I don't want to put too much uh, into that uh, at this moment because it's really, really tight. And Napoli is in there as well as at the moment is Atalanta who uh, remain in their fourth spot. Uh, and since we have been talking about them, Udine, as you see, is now moving up in eight ahead of Fiorentina. So um, I honestly think that the top seven those will be the top seven at the end of the season that we have here i just don't know in which permutation uh they will go we will know probably a lot more about who uh are the title contenders uh, uh, after this week milan napoli 
it's the big one and it's without Leao and it's without Osman. So both uh, teams without their main strikers, which uh, has me a little bit worried. What does not have me worried is Napoli is playing a little bit more open, which is easier for Milan to deal with like it was with the Inter game. I think there are two other really interesting games uh, in, in there with Roma against Atalanta, um, which could also tell us a lot about those two teams. Uh, Fiorentina definitely need to get something going against uh, Hellas, which were the, like the two teams like what is... Uh, um, a bit Udine uh, this, this, this season and speaking of Udine they have a home game against Inter which um, yeah that is also one that I would mark uh, to watch because that could be very 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 interesting it's also the last round before international break so that it's always uh, you know you could imagine uh, players going a little bit more all out uh, there so it could be a very interesting round any case Please let me know what you thought about this round. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel and see more videos like this. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the little bell icon so that you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day.